Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ice Cream for Everyone podcast. This is Willem van der Horst, your host for the show. All right, we're getting back on track for 2017. As I said in the last episode, I've been recording, been organizing recordings. I've got some exciting guests coming up for you, and we have an exciting guest coming up today, actually. Um, so as I pointed out in the last episode, and as I say, actually, during the interview and during the conversation I had with Patrick, uh, Patrick's the first guest I have with for 2017. And Patrick, somebody I've known for quite a while, I was quite excited to get him on the show, uh, because one of the things I really like to do on the show, and I've done for a few episodes, you know, and some of you know that I've traveled around, I've spent time living in different countries, I've spent time living in Asia, and uh, I like to bring perspectives from different parts of the world to this podcast, right? And Patrick is somebody I met while organizing and networking around London uh, for coffee meet coffee meetups. We had coffee meetups on a regular basis with people interested in strategic planning and brand and strategy, brand and marketing strategy. And Patrick was one of the people coming regularly to the coffee meetups. Uh, and since then, he's traveled and spent time in Asia, lived in China, and now has been for several years in Indonesia. Uh, and I caught up with him in Jakarta again when I was working for Saatchi in Singapore. And he has founded a company two years ago that's like booming and now opening offices in the Philippines. Uh, just opened offices in the Philippines a couple of months ago and planning to offices to open offices in different parts of Southeast Asia in addition to Indonesia and the Philippines that are the largest markets and the whole area considered Southeast Asia, of course. Indonesia with 300 million people plus, and uh, the Philippines with a little over 100 million, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the company in question is called GetCraft. So we talk about all that during the episode, of course, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But he's cornered a really interesting space of being a marketplace, connecting high-end professionals in the creative industry with brands and agencies and communications, advertising, PR agencies looking for those kinds of services that need really good writers, that need really good editors, that re need really good photographers, that need really good videographers, et cetera, et cetera. And GetCraft is the kind of platform that allows those to, to be brought together in Indonesia, which is a place there where there's very little of that. Um, and so we, we, we go over that in the whole episode. So I'll let him speak about it. And he talks about his experience of China, talks about his experience of Indonesia. And uh, yeah, so it's an episode full of goodness and really interesting to get some of the perspective of what's going on in the creative communications industry in Asia and what's going on in the startup industry as well. So we talk about some of the exciting startups going on in Jakarta as well. So now a little bit uh, about the podcast itself. Uh, and this is something I'm going to repeat, and I repeat every time. Like, if you're enjoying this, if you're listening to this right now, what makes a hell of a difference is if you take a few minutes to write a review. And uh, I usually read reviews. I didn't have any new. I don't have any new reviews at the time of this recording right now. Um, but you can just go on your podcasting app, whatever your favorite one is. If you're on an iPhone, it's going to probably be linked to iTunes, so you can write the iTunes review. If you go search for Ice Cream for Everyone on iTunes on your computer or search for Ice Cream Forever on your podcasting app, or on Stitcher, or whatever else you're using. And just take a couple of minutes and leave a review. It makes a hell of a difference. It helps a lot of other people find the show. Uh, and uh, you can also send me an email. Uh, so, I mean, all the information is on my main website. That's at www.icecreamforeveryone.net. Everything's spelled out, icecreamforeveryone.net. My email is Willem, W-I-L-L-E-M, at icecreamforeveryone.net. So you can send me an email there if you want to post a comment, if you want to tell me something. It is also hugely encouraging to just know that you're appreciating and enjoying the episode. You can tweet at me, like at Hippo Will. You can post a message on the Facebook page of Ice Cream for Everyone. You can send me an email. Ideally, post a review. Well, give me, like, many stars on the review if you can. Or if you don't want to give me any stars, tell me what's wrong with the show. Tell me how it can improve. I always want to improve things, right? So do that. And if you want to help, uh, send it to a friend. If you've enjoyed the episode, and if you enjoy the episode, send it to a friend. That's about it. So yeah, uh, without further ado, uh, I'll stop talking now. Uh, here is Patrick Sherrill, uh, founder of Get Craft. <music> Hey, Patrick, welcome to the show. Hey, Willem, how's it going? It's going great. Thank you very much. You're like, well, you are actually the first guest of 2017. This is exciting. Thank you very much for joining me for this. 
Um, I'm, I feel very honored. So thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's not going to be the <laughs> first be podcast it? published for 2017 because I got so late with my December scheduling and publishing, but that's not so much interesting. All right. For a bit of background, we haven't seen each other in a little while, but we did meet like a while back now. Like we used to go to, like we first met, I think at the planners coffee meetups in London it must have been <laughs> in 2008, I think. Yes. A long, long, long time time ago uh almost nine years i think well, it must be yeah, nine years uh, yeah, by yeah, twitter yeah. yes uh, yes yes that's right yes that was the twitter heyday like i was doing a lot of like networking and meeting with people yep. in the creative industries and planning etc but i thought it was interesting yep. just like lurking a little bit on your on your linkedin profile you um yep. studied like well or until studies in chinese like you were not particularly studying marketing or advertising or anything were you or or had you before so no, um, I was, yeah, I was studying Chinese, um, mm. Chinese economics. Um, and I did that for about three years and it's just a four year degree. And I think very much in the last year, I was getting very, um, as much as I love Chinese language, it's quite difficult to study. So mm. my last year, I was I was really getting fascinated about technology, the internet, which is what I was doing my thesis on. Mm. Um, and it made me start looking into, you know, future careers, um, back then. Right. And, you know, I was looking at, you know, like the, like the Accentures, the management consultants of the world, but also at the same time looking at, um, uh, advertising, planning, marketing, yeah. and quickly saw that, you know, personally, like I've much more preferred the cultural aspects of things, especially as I was, you know, studying different countries and so on and so forth. Mm. And yeah, that just led me to this Twitter, um, where I basically, as a student back then, um, quite an old student, that being said, um, I could go there and actually kind of reconnect with lots and lots of people in the industry and get lots of copies with them yeah. um, and really just kind of learn from them. Yeah. And because I had so much time on my hands, I think back then, um, I think I was helping a lot of people by literally kind of being like a, digesting a lot of different interesting links for everyone. Mm. So I was pretty actively tweeting back then because I just had time, whereas I think you guys were in full-time jobs. Um, and didn't really have that sort of, as much time to kind of like scan through Twitter and just kind of like read, read a lot about different subjects. And, and even then, so, I yeah, was, that's how we first met. Yeah, I was scanning and tweeting a lot more at that time. That was probably one of the the busiest times I was in, on. Well, one of the busiest I was on Twitter at that time. But this is a great lesson for yeah. everyone because, like, just for anybody who's listening and interested in getting into, I, I think, almost any kind of career or learning from other people, that's. What you were doing then is exactly what I was doing as well. And is exactly how I got into this industry is like, thanks to the time, attention and generosity of a few other people who had more experience and who were willing to meet me for coffee and share what yep. their experience was and just like, you know, allowed me to learn a lot more. And that's both like through them writing and reading articles and blog posts, as well as uh, getting yep. time for those kinds of coffee meetups that we had. Completely. And um, I think, you know, you talk about, I think, what was it called, like London Coffee, or what, I think it was just London Coffee, right? Or I, I can't coffee remember what it was. <laughs> Something like that. Um, but because of that as well, actually, I um, I started the LinkedIn, sorry, Like Minds chapter uh -huh. um, in Shanghai mm. um, it, with exactly the same, because I knew how much benefit I'd kind of drawn from that. Yeah. Um, and so as soon as I touched down in Shanghai uh, after my degree, I basically just went, great, okay, cool, like, let me open up a, a Like Mind chapter and, mm. you yeah, know, did that for about two and a half years and met some fantastic people also in advertising marketing design and yeah. so on and so forth industries cool. so that's yeah. awesome yeah it's yeah. it's really Good really lesson. cool very very cool yeah so you know if you're if you're looking to meet well like-minded people like is like mine still going yeah. it must right it's not i think i, I not? think noah um you know he's building percolate um yes. and i think you know they tried to revive it a few years ago but i think it's just you know they are it, it it's this so much opportunity and potential, but it's just really hard to manage it because it's just all over the world now. Um, yeah. So it's still sporadic in different countries and um, still going on, but I think it's it's less uh, influential than it was about mm. like three or four years ago. All right, cool. I actually know it's somebody I'd love to contact to get on the show. Um, all right, cool. The, one thing that's definitely still going on is Creative Mornings. Creative Mornings going strong. Oh, like, cool. okay. They do have a lot of different locations around the world. All right. Anyhow, uh, okay. tracking back a little bit more. Where are you from, Patrick? I'm from London, actually. Okay. So South London. Right. Yep. And so growing up, any particular just 
What kind of environment were you growing up in? What kind of teen or child were you? I think um, just really growing up, I um, my father is from Kenya. Okay. Um, and he's, in, he's English, he's from Kenya. And I think, you know, growing up that really, from a family perspective, um, it never really made us, it always made us question like being British or uh-huh. being English, which yeah. is quite a strong, you know, you can be a sort of strong English culture. Uh-huh. And I think we always had these weird, um, you know, aunties, uncles, like from Australia, from Africa, from uh, all over the world visiting us. And life just wasn't, I would say, a typical um, English life per se. Uh-huh. Um, and as a result, I think both like me and all my, like my sisters, um, we just like had this natural desire to travel the world, hmm. um, and see, you know, what is outside of the UK. And, um, so yeah, that's, that was, I would say life is kind of, that's how I think as a childhood it was. And so as soon as I was ready to go, you know, 18 years, is old like the first thing i could do was like well where's the country that scares me the most and i know the least about and that was china um is that what decided you to study chinese as well or? yes um oh actually no. so why i study chinese is that um i'm dyslexic so uh-huh. uh, i study i struggle with languages and i looked at it and said well okay like the type of persona that i am i'm like well the best thing i can do then if i can't um do a study a language or if I can't speak fluent languages, then I should learn. And why not go there and learn either Arabic or Chinese? And it just happened that, uh, China, uh, seemed a lot more fun and interesting and intriguing. So yeah. that's how I ended up in China, um, the first time. And again, I think you, I'm not sure if you've, you've spent any time there, but it's, once you bit. get it into your, into your blood, uh, especially if you're like 18 years old, um, it's very, very intoxicating mm. and, Ever since then, 18 years old, it was like, well, that's pretty much, you know, my decision to yeah. where I'm living for the next 10, 15, 20 years of my life. That's pretty much been made. By, right. Where'd um, you go the first time? I, was 18. I went to a place called Liu Zhou uh, uh-huh. in Guangxi province. Um, okay. So it's like South China on the border of Vietnam. Um, it's again, back then, that would be considered the small Chinese cities of 7 million people. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, there was only about, you know, like 10, 20 of like us who are on this program out there. Um, but just, um, just fun, phenomenal days and days that you can barely remember of just the speed yeah. of development and, um, just China in its heyday. But I said that would be probably like 2000 and like 6, 2007, really. And just like, or maybe even earlier, maybe 2000, yeah, maybe earlier, but just amazing. Like skyscrapers being built in, in front of your eyes in six months and yeah. you just, just, it gets, you get, yeah, I guess, and, and you, you, you fall in love with it. You get so an experience. And a, I went in 2007 uh, and actually among the places I visited, because one of my best friends was living, he lived in Guangzhou for several years and then was living in Shenzhen cool. at yeah. that point. Uh, okay. And I, well, actually nearby-ish, I mean, I went to visit Guilin and Yangshuo. Mm. I don't know if I'm pronouncing yeah. this right oh. at all, by the way, but. Yeah. That's perfect, yeah. Okay. That's, that's spot on. Okay, um, cool. I was literally, like, I was literally living like an hour from those places. Yeah, that's what it sounds so, like because it was in Guangxi, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's right. But the uh, sense of scale yeah. and the uh, it's just this experience of there's a lot of people here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how else to say um, it, and it doesn't doesn't do it justice at all. But you get the experience of like there's a lot of people, but it's also fascinating because. Um, and this is where I kind of started, started to realize that I was really interested in sociology, anthropology, mm. is that um, you jump on a train in China and you let you go on a train for 10 hours yeah. and you jump off the train. And, you know, if you look at it from just the outsides or from, you know, from the top level, it's it's the same city that you've gone to. You've just gone off one place and started because it's like communist kind of style yeah. um, repetition of concern kind of things. But when you start digging and looking a bit closer, you start realizing that, okay, people have different dialects or their face structure has changed and their shapes and they look visibly different. Mm. Or there's like this local speciality of food. Yeah. Um, or they're like, if you start asking them questions, then they're like, they, they're all known to be a certain way. And like, so, you know, people from Hangzhou are known to be very lazy and like, like to relax, et cetera. And people from Wuhan are very kind of famous for being uh, always trying to get money and trying to make a buck. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, you just, it would be this fascinating exploratory trip. Like you just jump on a train for 10 hours, get off. Uh, you've moved 2000 kilometers to 3000 kilometers. Yeah. Um, it's still China, but it's something's different about every single city. 
Right. And unlocking what that difference is and that similarity is just this this really fun game yeah. when you're being a traveler and um, seeing what the difference is. Did you have like one particular interesting or fun anecdote happening on, on train travels? This train is like a lot of the lifeblood <laughs> of the country, right? I In think... traveling. I, I think train travel, um, and I've done like quite a bit of it. So uh, we spent about just then we did six, six weeks or so just on trains, mm. um, sleeping on trains, traveling on trains, trains, buses, you know, I think what it really does is it, I wouldn't say that, like an anecdote about China travel, but mm-hmm. I think you get used to moving at different speeds. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm really fascinated with, um, different forms of like transport. So. I'm a cycle tourer as well. So okay. I've cycled across France and cycled across the UK. Huh? Um, and it's, if there's that, there's like the Einstein quote, which is, you know, E equals MC squared and like the speed of light. And it's just, you find that when you start moving at different speeds, be it walking or cycling or in a car or in a train, you start seeing countries in completely different lenses. Yeah. Uh, that completely shifts your perception of them. Yeah. And I think that's what I'd say from train travel. I love, I love doing it. It's a very, very, very um, addictive process, and you know, it's a great time to kind of, especially in China, we'd like you'd be sitting on a train for eight hours, yeah, um, just looking out the window and yes. listening to music and taking time to ponder stuff. So yeah, yeah, it's a very nice, nice time. I really, really enjoy that as well. All right, so mm-hmm. so then you you moved to? Did you decide just to fly to Shanghai? You had a job already when you first moved over there. Um, I had a job already. Um, so how did that I, work out? How did you? So I was actually the previous year I got an internship at this company called CIC Data. Mm. Um, and they were basically like the largest social media monitoring firm in, uh, China pretty much and doing, you know, what kind of like the NSA does, uh, but for the, like the commercial internet and for commercial internet companies. Right. Um, so I was working with them on as like a, um, consultant and they were intern, I should say. Um, and then just basically like after a year and being in London and speaking to all you guys back in London, you know, I had the decision to say, well, did I, A, um, decide to work for this small little agency called Anomaly who had yet to start up in London? Uh-huh. And did I want to join like the founder as number two employee? Or did I, um, I think there's like still a few internships and graduate scheme management schemes with BBH and Ogilvy on the cards. Mm. Um, or did I just kind of make the jump and go to China? Mm. Um, and I think just speaking to everybody, especially in London, because, uh, uh, it just felt that it seemed so much more, there's so much more opportunity in Shanghai. Yeah. Um, to go there and really just explore and make things happen, I guess, uh, I guess. So yeah, that's how it all started. Um, I just basically packed my bags and left, I think about two weeks after graduating, um, wow. <laughs> and just landed in Shanghai and, um, that's been you know, the roller coaster ever since then, I guess. <laughs> Exciting. So. Very, very cool. So, yeah. so you're yeah. first working with these guys were social media monitoring, which I guess in that, that, mm. I mean, that must have been, you know, it was early days for social media monitoring, wasn't it? Yeah. And it was, yeah, it was very early. Um, I think there's only like a few other companies in, um, the US who are mm. kind of like doing similar stuff. Um, and so there's like a one big competitor, I think in Singapore, um, who's still going. Um, but yeah, it was very early. And I think, you know, what was really fascinating about that is that actually it's, it's even to call it social media monitoring is kind of, yeah. it's just basically big data analysis. Yeah. Well, actually, do you um, want to explain a little bit what it is for anybody listening who's like be not very familiar with the idea? Sure. So essentially what uh, this company CIC would do is, um, would crawl the Chinese internet and the Chinese web and they would go there and, uh, I would say, first of all, suck up kind of conversations that are happening on the social web back then in China. So that would be from forums. Yeah. Uh, it would be from kind of channels like Weibo, which would be like chat, like uh, the equivalent of Twitter. Mm. Um, but also it would be, um, they're actually kind of using search engines to kind of scrape like new articles that are appearing, et cetera. Mm. So three forms of like data collection. Um, and to give you a nice, an idea, like they would, I think be picking up, just say about like, comments and stories about auto, the auto industry. Yeah. They would be scooping up at around about 11 million conversations every single month. Um, just about people talking about a particular brand of car. Mm. And then what the, the technology would do is would take that and then pass that into, um, basically relevant. Okay. This person is saying, um, here's the brand word. Here's the attribute or here's the adjective. Here's the attribute. 
Mm. And then they would create huge, basically sort that all out, start saying, well, what's happening month and month and month and what are the different trends of being said or what's being said, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and then once we had all that big quantitative data, we would then, uh, we'd give that to analysts who would then start dissecting that and say, well, what on earth does this mean? And why is there a spike of this? And why is that going up and down and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so that's what we would do. And we, then we'd sell these reports to big, uh, FMCGs, big companies, and even governments, you know, looking to kind of understand better about what are the, the Chinese populist thinking. Okay. Um, and how can we better understand what they're doing? So you typically do the research first and then sell it? I mean, you'd have an idea what kind of stuff your clients are looking for or? Well, this was the really interesting thing is that I, when they were first doing, um, when I was, when I was first there, they were just doing these big audit reports. Mm. And what I said to the company when I was there was, um, simply put, it's, it's too much data. You're giving people these 80 page reports that are phenomenal, but in almost like almost kind of unusable because they are like, it's covering so many topics that's mm. interesting, but they're not deep diving on enough different uh, angles. Mm. And I think what I learned by really like, you know, that year of being in London, kind of doing a big analysis or speaking to you, you guys and seeing that there's like these huge differences between, you know, product research, um, those doing planning, those doing kind of campaign analysis, those doing PR analysis, those doing, um, uh, like campaign tracking, et cetera, brand health monitoring. Um, what we did is we went there and actually looked at these huge, reports and said that's your how do we productize them in different ways so um, essentially what we did is we sliced these big reports and all the amount of data into different micro studies um that then allowed say a, a brand like a, a, an advertising agency or a pr agency to say i just want the influencer lists for this 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 etc i just want this piece etc mm. um and that's how powerful that company was because because they had so much data they just kind of didn't know what to do with it. And if you think that you have all the social data available to you, the, the actual the opportunities that you can come up with based on all of that data is just phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, um, absolutely. And so, yeah, that's what I did. I helped them pass cool. into different products and sell them back to the industry and, and basically help advertisers use it and marketers yeah. use it. And um, I was a straight up, you know, BD sales guy, strategist, um, going there and helping all these big companies just say like, what can you do with this data and how can you apply that? And yeah, it was a really great year and a half, uh, yeah. almost two years. Just, yeah. um, and again, selling to the really big brands and cool. really big contracts that Very just, cool. but just running around Shanghai doing it. Cool. And then just going through the curses after that, you like went over to an advertising agency, why didn't Kennedy? Is yes, that right? that's right. Yeah. Um, yes, that's right. Um, so, you know, I was there like with all this data telling people what to do about it. And uh -huh. so I thought, you know, I might, I might as well, uh, make the jump and actually, you know, <laughs> put the money where my mouth is and, you know, work in advertising. Yeah. Um, so yeah, make the jump across to Wyden, um, which was, yeah, uh, like, uh, I think in, again, if you've worked in there, like working in the Chinese advertising industry is, you know, quite a shock to anybody. Um, and you know, it was, yeah, very interesting, I guess, like very intense, mm. like almost just under a year, a uh, year or so, like working there. Mm. Um, how would you watching, describe working you know, for the Chinese? Advertising. Sorry to cut out, to cut you off, but how, how would you yeah. describe a little bit working for the Chinese advertising industry? At least at the time that you were, it might have changed since then, but I think it's still pretty similar. Um, okay. but essentially back then when I was, you know, like a junior manager, mm -hmm. um, Essentially, you'd finish up most nights about two o'clock in the morning. Oof. Um, <laughs> we start again at 10 o'clock. Wow. And, um, you know, they would pitch you, say, it's like we're working on, say, Nike. They would give you a, like, new pitch or a new brief on Monday. Uh -huh. And you'd be expected to present that, like, full creative deck back to them on Thursday. So you'd have, you know, three day turnaround times for big, big campaign briefs. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what it kind of, laid an imprint in terms of how to work in the Asia advertising scene, mm. um, where speed is, especially in China scenes, where speed is, is critical to being able to kind of, um, manage the amount, the growth that they're experiencing. Wow. Um, and yeah, it was a very, again, again, you learn a lot of things about how to manage yourself, how to, yeah, manage what they require and how to do, I guess, what's say like fast planning, fast strategy work, yeah, fast yeah. creative work, which I think is quite interesting. So I think one of the hardest things when foreigners go to China or go to Asia, they often struggle with that speed increase. 
Yeah. Because they just, they're so used to having some, you know, sometimes like I, I, have, I bring, you know, locals who've actually worked in to Amsterdam, bring them back to Jakarta and like they would be used to having three months to work on a big proposal. And yeah. I'd say, well, okay, you've got about a week for this. And it's yeah. just, it's very, very different and very challenging for people who are not used to it and how you need to adjust your yeah. uh, standards and way of working. Honestly, I, so, yeah. st- I struggled with that when I worked in Singapore. Um, yeah. and interestingly, having met now that I'm back in Europe, it seems to be that a lot of American clients and even European ones, like the times have shifted or, or I don't know if it's because of the agencies I've worked with, but a lot mm. of the timelines that used to be months are now like reduced to weeks or days. And, yeah. uh, and it's still something that I struggle with. Like I, you know, I, I learned to work a lot faster in Singapore and I was working relatively fast. I think I was working relatively fast when I was in London, but it was more of a, yeah. you know, two weeks turnaround than three days <laughs> or five days. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I still, yeah. I still, I still do struggle or at least I can do it, but I don't think it does justice to a lot of the, the work I'm doing. It really, but it depends. Yeah. It's always a case yeah. by case basis, of course. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's hard. Um, but it's, yeah, you, you learn the, yeah, the fundamentals of like, I'd say you have to learn the fundamentals. Mm-hmm. You have to learn how to use templates to kind of mm-hmm. support your thinking. But I agree. Like, I don't know if the work is ever to the standard that you'd, you'd hope because yeah. you just don't have time. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a great example in, I think in China and it was the, I think it was the launch of uh, Axe body spray. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was BBH and Flamingo did. They, they kind of mocked the, the, the trends by spending something like, you know, nine months researching and create, come up with a campaign for this big brand launch, mm-hmm. which back then was like huge amounts of time for like a, like from like PNG, I think. Um, and they completely changed, oh, sorry, uh, Unilever. Unilever. They completely changed it. It, it, was, it was either, okay, it was either Axe or, uh, Old Spice. I can't remember which one. Okay. Um, sorry. But it was the launch and they, 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 they literally went there and they said, you know what, we're going to take our time with it. And they did it. And I think they apparently launched and they got 60% market share within the year. So it, it, it's a nice kind of reminder as well that, you know, and I was always proud of the guys who worked on it um, yeah. and hearing about the stories of them working, but actually, you know what, like the speed is not always necessary and um, there is a better way to do that. Mm. And this is what can happen. If, so it's not that not the old adage that the market is, which is what China is and what Asia is, is that the market is growing so fast that we can just kind of, again pull up we don't need to grow market share because yeah. the market's growing so there's no point and it's nice to see the difference where they can actually we'll, we can own 60 percent from one year out yeah. which is amazing to see that is a good reminder absolutely are, are there any particular projects that you were proud of back in the time well maybe we might drop one more before i ask you that question actually sorry uh, so after mm-hmm. Shanghai, you decided to go, like, you moved around a little bit and uh, and then found yourself in Jakarta where you still are now. So like, how did that go on? So essentially, um, I think after that year at Wyden, um, I had, I basically been in China for about five years at that mm-hmm. point. Um, and the question was that for me was like, you know, did I want to A, stay in China? Um, I knew that I wanted to build a business, my mm-hmm. own business okay. um, already. And the question was therefore like, did I want to build a business in China or did I want to build a business somewhere else? Yeah. And I think again, I also studied economics and I just, I didn't really like the the scene that I was seeing in China from a political and economic standpoint about five, six years ago. Hmm. So I decided just to go and have like a walk around, um, or the, uh, like, yeah, I look around Southeast Asia and there I kind of basically spent about six, I think about three months, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, visiting all of Southeast Asia and learning about Southeast Asia and really um, came across Jakarta, which is just this absolutely phenomenal city. <laughs> um, and just, again, my old uh, boss from CIC, he's just kind of really good mentor and friend of mine, Sam Plumbing, just went there and I was, came back to Shanghai and he was like, hey, listen, you know, China, you're too late for China. Um, you should go somewhere else. And so, yeah, end up in Jakarta. Mm. Um, and, I, and again, the reason why I think I ended up here is because like first week I was meeting with, you know, to, like basically the head of all the e-commerce, head of PayPal, head of uh, all these people in the first week that right. I touched down on the ground, all the wow. head of media. Um, and it's just, you start realizing that it's just so much opportunity out here, yeah. but also that they were really struggling in terms of education and knowledge. Hmm. And you can kind of see how much, how you can actually be a part of that and helping the, the, 
the industry kind of get better here. So mm. that's, that was the decision really for why Jakarta versus Singapore versus uh, Bangkok versus um, Hong Kong, uh, where I had like different offers. But yeah, I decided to make a punt on Jakarta. What, what are some of the things that you really, really enjoyed at first uh, and still enjoy probably about, about Indonesia and Jakarta? So I think um, in Jakarta, Indonesia and just Indonesians in general, they are, when you, when people first come here, they are absolutely scared shitless mm -hmm. um, because they hit this huge wall of traffic. Yes. Um, and <laughs> it's kind experienced. of like, the, the, the thing about it is that actually the traffic's not that bad, really, if you know how to kind of navigate it. Yeah. Um, but it just, it, it makes people think that it's just this absolute, like, crazy place, but actually it's really not. Um, yeah. But when you start looking below the surface, you just see that there's, yes, you know, there's potentially not all the, the standardizations, the, like, the best practices that you're used to, but as a result of that, you have these huge amounts of kind of creativity <laughs> um, that just, like, thrives all over the place mm. um and again that, that's coming from yeah lack of just standardization best practices you know it's there isn't that much bureaucracy that's getting in the way of things yeah um there's also like if you just look at it from a cultural perspective you have essentially what are around about again i don't even know the real number anymore it's like a thousand two thousand different tribes of people different cultures mm. who managed back in the 1940s 1950s to pretty much blend together and become one country without entering into a huge civil war where they kind of smash each other apart and kind of ruin all of their different cultures, which is something, you know, China managed to do that by um, having a cultural revolution and kind of really standardizing things. Um, India kind of doesn't, is also struggling with just the fact that there's so many different types of people there yeah. and so many different religions, etc. Somehow Indonesia managed to semi, um, you know, standardize a country, um, yet still keep that huge amount of depth of creativity of kind of, um, different kind of, I guess, backgrounds and culture. And yeah, it's just, it's very fun once you like see what that leads to from a purely creative standpoint. Interesting. So do you think that kind of like bringing the country together? Cause I don't know that much about the history of Indonesia. I only know like, well, you know, from my father, because he cooks a lot of Indonesian food as a Dutch person that, yeah. you know, Java, <laughs> yeah. Java was a Dutch counter, but, and colony. Yeah. But, um, how much, you, how much of it do you think was like governmental, political or administrative organization, and then I think there's like, there must be the layer of, uh, of the religious side of things, uh, Islam being the main religion that might, that might have brought some of a lot of the population together. Or I don't know. What are your thoughts about that? I think for the most part, it's, um, it's just really, um, I said the government back then, you know, to go there and actually kind of, because what was happening is, um, it started out yeah, being like kind of like controlled by the Dutch. Mm -hmm. Um, then, you know, the second world war came and, and you know, there's like a fight between the Dutch and the Japanese, you know, trying to kind of own the land, etc. And I think, you know, when the Japanese kind of lost, there was this kind of time where, um, I think the Dutch were kind of saying, great, you know, we can go back in there and kind of re-control things. Um, and I think at that, at that point, as there was happening, you know, across the world and from an imperialization standpoint, empire standpoint, you know, they went there and said like, Hey, it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> we want to kind of go there and actually kind of rebring, we can basically, um, become our, our own people. Mm. Um, and that was basically the government's kind of going there and actually kind of having like a small civil war against like the Dutch. Um, but pretty much then like finding their own freedom. Mm. Um, I, I think it was like they had their 70th anniversary like last year, I think. So whatever that, um, yeah. parallel that makes Indonesia. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was very much, it was very much a, I don't think they were trying to do it as in, you know, um, we not, they weren't necessarily thinking like how do we bring everyone together, but mm -hmm. they were definitely thinking in terms of, we want to kick out the Dutch. So yeah. we're all going to fight for one cause. And it just happened to be the case that they, um, you know, did it in a way that, yes, there's definitely been like, you know, controversies and definitely being, you know, people being persecuted, um, different minorities and different religions, et cetera. Um, but all things considering, if you look at it, it's quite impressive that they've managed to pull together 320 million people, whatever the number is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, without too much kind of political strife, too much kind of like, um, yeah, grief, I'd say. And then as a result, you get this below the surface, just this very, very rich cultural, yeah. um, tension. And, and actually, I think the other thing that is strange about Indonesia that I kind of love about it is that, um, 
that being said, they sometimes in lesions are just highly ineffective and mm-hmm. they basically, you know, even though they have this huge amounts of richness to the culture, um, they don't always, you know, leverage it to being what you'd say, like, you know, front facing modern kind of super or modern, modern country. And it's absolutely fantastic that they don't because I think they are, the Indonesian people are really very, very family uh, orientated. Mm-hmm. And it's really nice because, you know, especially in, say, Western societies and even China, like work and money comes first. Yeah. And in Indonesia, it's like family comes first. Mm. And it's really difficult to kind of get your head around that. But it's really, really nice once you start realizing that actually this is how it should be. It it should be that you're, you know, you're living to work. It should be that you're kind of, you know, working to live, I guess. And it's, that's something that I think it took, it, again, when I came from China, um, I was like, you know, schooled in being a, a Chinese advertising guy. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you know, really quite <laughs> working very, very hard. Um, but when it came to Indonesia, it was just a very big learning about, wait a second, um, that style of management doesn't really work here. Yeah. Um, you've got to kind of change how you are. And essentially, I think they did a pretty good job of making me a bit less of a, an asshole that China can make you sometimes <laughs> and helped me kind of come a bit more rounded, yeah. which is to be straight up, to be honest. So. Yeah, that's so that cool. Was the other, like more personal reason, I guess. That's right? very, very cool. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, I, from my side, yeah. it was interesting. Like the, the, I mean, it's great to learn more about Jakarta, and uh, because the first time when I was traveling around Asia, and the general message boards or like Lonely Planet forum equivalents, the backpacker scene was just everybody was like, "Oh my god, don't go to Jakarta! Don't go to Jakarta! It's just traffic and wall of traffic. Just like get out yeah. of there, go to the countryside, go somewhere else, go to Bali." Um, but, yep. uh, but then when I moved to Singapore and I started talking to some people who went there on a regular basis, and I, then I think I probably heard it from you that there was like a really very interesting, vibrant, artistic and startup scene and tech scene and a lot of young people up to interesting yep. projects and ideas. And, and I, and I was quite inspired by hearing you talk about it. And I'm, and, and I'm back inspired by hearing you talk about it now, yep. which is cool. So, so like you wanted to build a yeah. business. Did you know you wanted to build a business for a while? Like that was like one of the things you wanted to do? Uh, yes. Um, I don't know why the actual ownership part of that was, but yeah, I think, um, I think that was always somehow was on, I think maybe just, I was just idiosyncratic enough that I didn't really enjoy or, or always would have questions against my boss or the person managing me at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I always knew kind of there was like, I had to kind of, get to a point one day when I was ready to kind of build my own business. Great. So how did that um, come up? So how did GetCraft yeah. come about then? So GetCraft is, um, so yeah, this is like, you know, it's a long story. So sure. GetCraft well, started, the, f- the first first idea started in China and the seed of the idea started in China with mm-hmm. me and a friend, you know, just kind of having, you know, after work beers, um, yeah. as the, most ideas do. But <laughs> essentially, you know, we were, in China, we were getting uh, people come, coming up to us and asking us all the time, like, hey, Patrick, you know, you work at an agency and a really good agency. Like, do you know a good videographer or do you know a good web developer or do you know a good writer? And mm-hmm. this wouldn't be just, you know, small, this wouldn't be like individuals. This would be like big companies like coming into the market saying, and friends saying, hey, like, you know, um, I'm pulling bear. I'm coming in. Like, can you connect us to somebody who can help us do this, 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 this? And what I think it became, or well, back then it was really apparent was that like, you know, you don't actually, you don't, there isn't anything that makes it easy to find out these, who are these professionals and who are these different kind of people who can help you from a marketing communication standpoint, um, in all these different markets. Mm. Um, and that was, I think the first inkling and we were kind of just bashing around, like, did we create like a weird little website, you know, with just like a directory kind of back then in China of just really good people who, <laughs> instead of people always asking us like, Hey, um, do you know a good website developer or a good writer or something? We can just go in and direct them to this list and be like, Hey, listen, you know, just take a look here. Like here's some good people we trust and off you go, etc." cetera. Mm. So I think that was the, the, like the, the very early inclination of the idea. Um, and it just, I think over the years, as you know, came to like Jakarta, um, working at Ogilvy and just trying to do, you know, other forms of marketing and getting really frustrated because, um, again, it's really hard to actually, you know, contact and know, um, 
what type of kind of writer or which writer is good if you're freelance writers or videographers or even looking at from the, me- the media standpoint and like which how do you connect with publishers how do you connect with sites how do you connect with influencers yeah it's actually really 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 hard um and so we basically yeah came up with getcraft um whose job it is to go there and actually try and fix the problems that advertising and marketing have um and i, I should say probably also like the bigger creative process that you know is also going on in the likes of you know, between meet with media and creators themselves and trying to fix all these different problems of kind of that there are many of them and make basically make it easier for advertisers and marketers to do their jobs and also creators themselves do their jobs yeah um so that's how it kind of came about yeah so how would you describe the structure of the of the so so on one side you have uh professionals like videographers writers and the like yeah. and that's and the, you're yes. operating like so uh, you know if i'm a journalist or anybody that's probably working freelance let's say i can sign up to get craft hat so yeah. like just like how does the whole structure yeah, correct. yeah so essentially what we are at the core is a marketplace um just a marketplace that connects like an exchange um that just connects um i would say the creative industry together and tries to kind of standardize things mm. um so that's the marketplace part. But yeah, as a writer or as a freelance creator or as a publication or an influencer, you can sign up. Um, and what we have is kind of st- like basically a three part application form. Yeah. Um, which is just, just to go there and actually make sure that you are, um, you know, you're, first of all, you're, you're, you're valued, you're, you're a high quality professional. Yeah. When it comes to all those different industries, et cetera. So you have to kind of a little bit about who you are. You've got to sh- submit up your portfolio. And then you just got to go there and agree to some like, you know, terms that are just standardized good ways of working, mm. which is also the hard part when it comes to the people working with freelancers, you know, how quickly are they going to respond, um, copyright issues, the kind of legal issues, et cetera. Yeah. So that's what, um, that's what we try and do, um, in terms of the creative part and really like the, the quality of the people we're looking for are, it's not like a, we're not trying to be like a freelancer.com. It's just a very, that, that's what I was going to ask you the question. Um, yeah. I was going to ask like the Elance or freelancer.com kind of thing. It's, it's yeah. So we're, we're very, very high end. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, we're just looking for like, so I'd say the top like, five, 10% of people, mm-hmm. uh, who will be accepted to the sites who are kind of more, I'd say commercial level quality, um, the, who, the, who brands and agencies want to work with and who they can trust, et cetera. Hmm. So we do that, that first betting and the people who are doing the betting is it was always like a questionnaire, which is a great way to kind of literally weed out people straight away. Um, we help by just going there and like all the people who are working at Getcraft today are just ex agency folks right. working in production. So, you know, they're, they're applying, you know, their standards and saying, well, like, right, are these people good enough to, do we trust them enough to kind of feature them on the network? Yeah. Um, but then once they're on the network, then we have, um, uh, again, I don't know exactly how number of millions now, but they're roughly about 600 different kind of like clients who are kind of going there and actually using them on different content projects. So for whatever they're trying to do, um, and whatever marketing they're trying to have and so on and so forth. So what we do is we help then make that connection as streamlined as possible. So fixing all the pain points that exists when it comes to, okay, so we've, we've, we've fixed the discovery, we've, then we've, how do you brief them correctly? How do you um, make sure that, you know, you're managing the process so, like, you know, that you're not going crazy with the revisions? How do you make sure that um, you're measuring everything correctly? How do you make sure that you're, um, everyone's getting paid, everyone's happy about this type of stuff, and so on and so forth? So yeah. trying to fix all those different problems and fix that for essentially six mini micro, mini marketplaces, oh. which is what we're running today. And so um, is it that, is the idea that uh, the... the 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 providers that are on the platform are located in well say the the market in question so Indonesia so like it's particularly for Indonesian professionals or for international ones or as well as on the client side Correct. uh Indonesian ones or Southeast Asia or yeah so we're really focused at like Southeast Asia right now mm-hmm. um so today we are in Indonesia and Philippines yeah um which but that was a recent the recent thing. Congratulations on the Philippines. That was like at the end of last year, right? Yeah, that was about four months ago. Um, and that's again, it's really fascinating. The Philippines is a whole other, uh, just amazing country and <laughs> amazing people and completely different to, uh, Indonesia. Um, so really fascinating to go there and opening that up. Um, mm-hmm. and then next year we're going to be opening up in Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand and Vietnam wow. as well. So, um, so yeah, four more markets, uh, on the cards. Um, 
And we can do that because, you know, we have this technology platform behind us now that mm. is kind of, is working. Um, and I think, you know, Philippines is interesting because it opens up, us up to the world. Yeah. But still, like, we really care about Southeast Asia. And I think we really care about the creative scene and you know, the marketing scene in Southeast Asia. And so how can we fix that? And mm. how can we help them get better? And how can we solve the problems um, that are existing in that market? Um, so that's our, you know, our next year's goal is to really go and go, like, go hard and fast into Southeast Asia. Mm. Um, but I think what's really funny about this is that you know, the problem I'm talking about, um, it exists actually like in every single, it, it's a world problem. Yeah. It's not just a Indonesia problem. And it just happens to be the fact, I think that the reason why we can build a business like this in Indonesia um, is because things are a little bit more confusing and a bit more muddled and um, than potentially Singapore or London or New York. Yeah. But actually, if you really look at the heart of the problem in the likes of, say, like New York or London um, or even China, you know, it, it, the exact problem is still there. Like, you, you can't go. There's nowhere you can go like today and say, OK, uh, I'm Will. Um, I'm in London. I need to make some really good food how to videos. Yes. Um, who's going to help me do that? There's, there's no way that does that. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of crazy that if you think about it, that we, the advertising industry doesn't do that. And there isn't actually like a standardized place where, you know, you can have a profile of the person, like even yourself, right? As a strategist, right? You, like there's, it's a bit crazy that there isn't really a, maybe there are many micro marketplaces, but there isn't a big, big marketplace for just kind of people to say, well, actually, I think there's a few places that aspire and aspire or have aspired to do that. Like, and I wonder how much mm. like a somewhere like you know a portfolio place like a Behance is was meaning to do something like that or is meaning to do something like that, but with marginal success perhaps. Yeah, um, I don't know. Well, actually, it's interesting. What's really interesting about Behance and startups generally, right, is that um, and again we're going to be like straight up like we're going to be trying to build portf- like you know portfolio services for um, creators. And even like potentially even strategists and one day, you know, you know, I would say more knowledge workers, right, in the future. Hmm. But if you think about it, like um, the, the, the aspects of, let's say, being a freelancer, and you know this probably better than anyone else, right, is that you first of all got to build a website, which yeah. is quite hard. Yes. Because um, it, 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 it looks easy, but actually, you know what, you know, you've got to do, uh, I've got to you know, get a hosting, I've got to find something that's nice, I've got to populate the content. Okay? Yes. First problem. And you need Second to update problem. it. Like I need to update mine. I did it like a year and a half, two years ago. Now, like something just, it's too slow. It doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I didn't have yep. time to redo yep. it yet. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Um, the second thing is, you know, you don't get any work because, you know, you have to go there and actually, and that's where the marketplace comes in handy. So you say, you know, great. I can actually feature myself and be kind of get connected straight away to, you know, all the different clients looking for to give me work, et cetera. Yeah. Um, the third part is that, then they come to you and they say, I want to work with you, but um, there's no briefing template um, and you can't really price your services. And they will basically, you know, because of that, there's lack of ambiguity of like what is success, what is defined, et cetera, mm. which leads to problems. Yeah. There's communication problems. There is payment problems. So what we're trying to do is to say, well, actually, can we build like an end-to-end solution for a creator? And, and I, I use the word creator very loosely there. Yeah. But can we build like an end to end solution for a creator? So I can say, Hey, listen, you know, for $10 a month, you kind of get like a Behance, but on steroids. So yeah. as well as kind of the portfolio, you can use it like your full one stop, uh, project management platform and payment platform. So that you don't need to kind of go to PayPal, go to other places and so on, go to different things. Like, yeah. Why isn't there just a one stop pla- platform? I like um, it as a well lot. As getting, yeah. So, so that's what we're trying to do. Mm. Um, got it. That's really and, cool. And so, like, generally, uh, uh, members pay a subscription, and then, like, just in terms of curiosity about the curious about the financial model, people pay a subscription, mm-hmm. and then do you take a cut off like payments, ex- payment exchanges through the platform, something like that, or? Yeah, like I think we're probably going to be like people pay a very very small subscription fee if they mm-hmm. want to get you know more advanced features like a portfolio or their own like hosted portfolio. Mm-hmm. Um, but pretty much, you know, because it's Southeast Asia. Um, SaaS, uh, which is software as a service and yeah. recurring payments is, it's very new here. So, you know, you can't really, um, use those models yet because mm. people aren't really willing to pay you 20, 30 quid a month. Um, so probably what we'll do is we take more of a commission. Yeah. So simply put, we'll say that, you know, um, we'll give you access to all these services, 
um, which you can kind of go there and actually use and showcase, etc. Yeah. And simply put, like any any project, we'll take like ten percent off the mm. top of that, and that's including you know payment fees. Yeah. So and that's again cross market. So you can go there and say, all right, you know, I'm going to create an article for a hundred dollars, um, and I think that you know we think that okay, if we take ten dollars out of that, so you get ninety, we get ten. We think that's a pretty good deal if you can also manage the you know, all the end pieces of that and streamline your work and so on and so forth. Hmm. Um, and if you think about it, it's like PayPal will take about two, three percent anyway. Yeah. So yeah, if absolutely. we can get it to about like ten percent, we think it's a pretty good deal. Yeah. That's what we're that's what we're like playing around with right now. Cool. And chatting to small creators about that. Cool. Um, that's so, brilliant. Yeah. It's very very cool. And so like back to your point about like supporting the creative industry and creatives in the country and in Southeast Asia, I think. Like according to a few things I've read, you, you're still you and and Getcraft are still facilitating meetings. Or you're also participating in a is it a nonprofit endeavor? That's oh, so no, doing, I, I don't know if you're know, still doing that, but yeah. So Endeavor is just um, you know this is a a third it's this company that just helps you know the like small startups and mm. businesses who are looking to grow here. So I act as like an advisor, just helping them with you know marketing strategy and so on and so forth. Cool. Um, just just helping them like, as a small business, how do you survive, basically? Yeah. Um, okay. But we yeah, we run um, we run now. I think we've got three different events going in uh, Indonesia and Nilla. Um and so I think yeah, like just literally su- there to support the media industry, support the uh, marketing industry, and support mm. the creative industry. What are the um, events? Just so like I can add the links in the show notes when we publish it for anybody sure. who's wondering. Uh, so it's Jakarta content. Jakarta content marketing meetup. Yeah. Um, very direct. Yeah. Uh, Indonesia journalism meetup. Okay. Um, and now Philippines content marketing meetup. Cool. Um, All right. And uh, so basically it's like for each city we're going to go into, we're always about, you know, how do we kind of teach local creatives, local media, how to yeah. make a living from this new gig economy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and vice versa. How do, yeah. So that's yeah. And so that's really, really exciting. I mean, it's just been very, it seems to have been very successful or it is very successful and it's very like exciting that you're growing and rolling out to all the different countries. It's brilliant. Congratulations. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a whirlwind, but fun. Yeah. And so like just on the uh, interesting on the, on the side of the brands and clients that come to the platform, do you, yeah. what do you do to keep them interested, to keep them coming or to get them, well, to know it in the first place? Do you, is there anything in particular, just like getting keeping in touch with a lot of different brands and advertising the platform so that they visit it, or or, or do you also work both yeah. with advertising agencies as well as directly with brands, or how does it? Is there a tendency on that side or trend? Yes. So yeah, we actually um, like we I re- I really like actually the advertising business. Um, I think they do a really bad job sometimes. Um, <laughs> I don't think they're fixing a lot of the problems that really make the industry like not fun to work in. Uh-huh. Um, but we, we really do want to support advertisers and advertising agencies. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what they can, advertisers can do is basically like get a, a white label version of our website. So they can go there and say, all right, I am like Ogilvy and yeah. make it easy. And you know, I don't want to have a getcraft.com, uh, branding. I want it to be Ogilvy creative suites.com. Right. So they can literally, they will be able to purchase, um, a license and just get, you know, their own, curated version of that network that marketplace themselves hmm. um and so that's how we um support uh again get clients i guess so um basically rolling out here more like bespoke uh custom solutions and the likes of you know that would be from a, a, an agency standpoint mm-hmm. but like then also have like clients will come directly to us and say well okay get craft um say i'm Unilever. um you know i'm running 30 different brands in uh indonesia um, I'm not really tracking the efficiency of working with any of these creators. And I would love to have a single platform where I can see all these different engagements going on, et cetera. Mm. So again, they're making white label, like bespoke versions of our tool, um, just for them. So they can say, great, we want to work with these 50 writers who are fantastic about food and healthcare and beauty. Mm. We want to work with just these publishers and just these influencers and the platform can help measure and track the effectiveness of doing all this type of work. Got it. Um, as well as just kind of streamlining the, the workflow between all this. Cool. Um, and it gets really interesting when you're like a Unilever and you're doing that for 30, 30 different brands because they have all this data that's just, if you think about it, it's just and campaign data and sales data that's not being used, utilized at all. Yeah. Um, but if we can start kind of going there and saying, Hey, 
we're kind of analyzing all this data for you on your behalf, which goes back to the old business back yeah. in China. Yeah. Um, if we can start kind of telling you that actually the most effective places to spend media and to this type of work is really effective and people like this and you're getting 25 times better efficiency when you're doing this and this, this, it starts getting really, really interesting in terms Ooh. of what that would mean from a big, big brand who's spending, you know, five, $10 million on like content alone every mm. single year. Mm-hmm. Cool. So that's, that's, the flip side from the very, very cool. side. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank you for, for your time. We're going to wrap this up. I usually finish by uh, a couple of the, what I'm calling the cool down questions. Uh, something okay, sure. that is, you know, it's, we're still in the ice cream for everyone podcast. So I like to ask questions about <laughs> okay. ice cream and, and given we're talking about Indonesia, is there like, yeah. what's, there's always some kind of ice based, you know, sweet dessert. What, what's the, is there an Indonesian specialty for something ice cream or ice cream like? Ooh, that is they do actually um indonesia's got really sweet tooth yeah so you can get lots and lots of different i think you know they actually so that, that's a really hard question for this market because is you probably have i think there's durian ice cream which yes. is very popular and i think you also get deep fried durian ice cream which i think is pretty special i have not um, tried i mean i've tried durian ice cream which is weird enough and i've tried that in singapore of course like it's you know popular fruit yeah but uh, yeah. the deep fried one I did not hear yeah about. it's kind of like it's kind of like got a casing over it of uh-huh. uh, batter and the, the, the inside it, it's got the jury inside the middle of it, so et cetera. Yeah. Um, you, and, and you have like jury and panna cotta. You have, uh, you have avocado smoothies, avocado and chocolate smoothies. That's pretty cool. Um, they are, they, they have a very sweet tooth and they, yeah, for, for ice cream, uh, uh, aficionado, they, it's a pretty good place to come for different flavors and different weird, uh, yeah. desserts, I would say. Yeah. Cool. How about yours? Do you have a favorite uh, ice cream flavor? I'm not actually. I'm not a big ice cream fan. Okay, cool. Uh, I'm much more of a I'm much more of a coffee and uh, cocktail kind of type person. So okay, yeah. All right. Well, how about like uh, what's going on on the cocktail scene in Jakarta? Is there a particular cocktail bar you'd recommend if anybody goes and visits? I would. Um, I think. Oh, that's good. That's a very good question. Um, I think there's a really good like place that we, we go to. It's just called La Quartier. Uh-huh. So it's a really fantastic, you know, uh, typical French bistro, but done in a really, really well done style. So mm. um, I think, yeah, you get some really good cocktails made up there. Um, but it's, it's, again, it's strange because, you know, it's, it's not like a, I think Singapore recently is a really kind of, uh, Singapore, Bangkok is just fantastic, like food, food yeah. scene, I'd say. Jakarta is, it's got its own trend and no habits that don't, haven't quite got yet, that yet, but. For local tastes, it's really, really strong. Mm. And okay. the locals don't really care that much about the cocktail scene as much. Right. But they I do was wondering if the kind of prohibition, very fancy cocktail mixology type stuff had reached there because I know that there's loads in Shanghai and Singapore, et cetera. Yep. So don't know if that's the case. Not yet. Okay. Not yet as much, which is a shame. I, I, I love it, but it's, <laughs> it hasn't made it down here yet. Yeah. Cool. Uh, how about like a uh, an exciting startup in Jakarta that you that you think is like really really interesting for whatever reason? Well, um, okay, wait a sec. I'm gonna I'll have to name kind of the name of this. Um, mm-hmm. There's actually two. But there's the easy one, which is Gojek. Okay. Um, and if you haven't, I don't know if you've heard of Gojek, but I haven't. Gojek is essentially um, a phenomenal app that allows you to go there and. Um, Pretty much via motor courier, you can order anything. Uh, motor scooter, you can order anything. So you know, you can, I could go there and within 10, 15 minutes get food delivered to me. I can get a ride. I can get groceries delivered to me. I can go there and get movie tickets uh-huh. um, and so on and so forth. And it's just this phenomenal utility app um, mm. that's going, um, growing rapidly. But actually, I would say the other one that's, and I need to, I need to get the right name for this. Um, I think it's called Sales Stock. I think okay. if I'm not mistaken. Um, and essentially what it's, they're trying to do is completely upend Nielsen uh-huh. and all these big research companies. Um, and they do that by simply asking people to take pictures of their receipts um, oh, and wow. incentivizing them for doing so. And it's basically, it's going absolutely huge here. Hmm. Um, so they're all kind of ex kind of Nielsen people in there as well, et cetera. But they're basically saying, you know what, it's a, it's a really clunky method of doing research and collection. Yeah. Um, and I think they've already like winning awards all over the place, already kind of backed by Google and kind of go to San Francisco 
but basically they're they're gunning for yeah nielsen and the likes etc I'll, I'll, I'll find their rights great name of the i'll add the to link to the show notes. cool any but last words they are, yeah sorry yeah. no no go ahead no. okay cool no I, no yeah, no last words just yeah, come to southeast asia don't just enjoy it and don't be scared <laughs> excellent yeah go and visit southeast asia and go and visit the big cities as well as the beaches as well as the mountains as well as all the tourist spots i think yes definitely Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Patrick. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, good luck for all the rollouts for all the international conquests for GetCraft. And uh, that's about it. Um, have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Cheers. You too. Thanks. Right. I appreciate it. It's great talking to you. Cheers. Yeah. Bye. Well, that's it. Another episode wrapping up, another episode ending already. I'm always wondering if I'm being formulaic. Well, I guess it is formulaic because it's the outro of the episode. The main idea is to thank you for listening. If you're still listening to now, I hope you really, really had a good time. Hope you had a good time finding out more about what's going on in China and Indonesia with Patrick. I really enjoyed the conversation. It's really good to hear that his business is doing extremely well. That's really, really good. When you have friends and people you know, that are starting things that are really working out is brilliant. I think it's very exciting. And it is exciting what's going on in Jakarta, what's going on in Southeast Asia altogether, how fast it's growing. And and there's really this sense of just like new opportunities. When you go over there, there's there's a lot of that going on, which is pretty cool. So yeah, if you enjoyed it, just share it with a friend, send it over to somebody else who might enjoy it as well. If you've got feedback, questions, comments, I'd love to hear from you, as I said. Uh, you can find more of these episodes on the main website. That's www.icecreamforeveryone.net. If you go on there, please sign up for the newsletter. If you want to get regular read-ups, regular uh, links to the things I'm reading, to the things I'm interested in, to funny gifts or interesting gifts, to funny video or interesting videos, what's going on in gaming, what's going on in the creative communications industry, what's going on in my life, you know. Uh, generally speaking, there's going to be a lot of things coming up. As I said on the last episode, I'm traveling to the U.S. very soon, and I'll be traveling around to a few different destinations, uh, and I'll be organizing meetups, and I'm, I'm still working on a lot of the future of Ice Cream for Everyone, so keep following, keep it up, um, and ask questions, give me comments, you know, no problem. Please post a review, if you can, on iTunes. That makes a hell of a difference, as I said at the beginning of the episode. That's about it. I'll stop begging now uh, and leave you to get on with your morning, afternoon, night, whatever it is. Have a great time and a great day or a great evening, great night. Until next time, bye.